Welcome to Grace Class. Uh, I think I should almost probably reintroduce uh, the class itself. It has been uh, quite a while since we've done this. Um, between the shutting down of uh, the regular church services so we could have Sunday school class and uh, the fact that I started that time off with the flu and some seasonal allergies and it knocked me for a loop for a while. Uh, it has been some time and uh, Catawba is doing a Sunday school class with Norm Monroe, so it's kind of like I didn't want to feel like we were competing, but I was um, reminded recently that we need uh, to still feel like we are a class ourselves. And there are one or two people, I think, that might be picking up on this again at this particular uh, time and the season that we are going through. Uh, people are uh, just doing some different things, listening to some different things as they are more um, stuck at home. Uh, so if this is a help to you, then uh, great. If not, then obviously I won't know if you turn it off early or not. Uh, but I was thinking about what we are, are going through, and uh, it definitely, uh, there was some uncertainty about whether to teach Sunday school. Um, there's been uncertainty surrounding the school situation with uh, many schools uh, shutting down for a period of time and a significant period of time and uh, the uncertainty there of how do I teach uh, my class and uh, for me it actually proved to be fortunate that we were doing this Sunday school thing because so I was a little bit used to um, doing the YouTubes for that and so it was just how do I incorporate those uh, using YouTube for the classroom? And so far it seems to have worked. It's given uh, the students something to listen to and then go and do their work. And evidently it's not too hard because I have one particular student who has, uh, he's about three weeks ahead on me already. So uh, good for him. Uh, I hope that we don't go back to school before that time is up because then he'll be sitting there looking at me while the rest of them are still doing something. But I was looking at this idea of uncertainty and, you know, I came across a headline without really having to search very much for it, just came across it and it came out this week and it was uh, just called Modeling Cor Coronavirus, Coronavirus, but here's the thing, uncertainty is the only certainty. Uncertainty is the only certainty. And as we are going to uh, get back into teaching, um, beginning with uh, next week, we will start the book of Romans in Romans chapter 1, looking at the grace of God in Romans chapter 1 and, and just taking it as the, as the Lord opens up uh, different portions of that chapter and we'll just see how far it goes for us and Hopefully, long before we would reach the end of that study, we'll be able to be back together in a church setting. Uh, but I was thinking in terms of that word uncertainty and applying it to the resurrection. You know, here it is. I'm recording this now on Good Friday. Uh, Christ is on his way, if not already hanging on that cross. And the resurrection, Resurrection Sunday, Easter is just around the corner. But do you know that there was uncertainty in the resurrection? Um, and I want to look at different individuals and, and that uncertainty. So this is more of a, it's a devotional kind of study, um, looking at a lot of scripture and then just very brief comments to remind us about uh, the uncertainty of individuals that were in that time. You know, first of all, when you and I'm trying to take these sort of in order, if you will, Christ has been crucified. He's actually been taken down off of the cross. He's been laid in the tomb. Even that creates some uncertainty of what they had been hearing for several years and not understanding that and not seeing how that was all playing out, there's an uncertainty in their minds. Remember those disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane had uncertainty about 
what was happening with the arrest of Christ, and they scattered. Uh, John and Peter were going to follow the arrest and, and end up at the high priest's house, and you know Peter's uncertainty is going to cause him to deny Christ. Um, and then we, we have the cross, and Christ is on that cross, and uh, the uncertainty of those who are watching who did not anticipate that their Christ, their Messiah, would be doing this because they were not understanding the whole picture. So now he's in the tomb, okay? When you look at Matthew 28, 1 through 4, we have the women coming to the tomb with spices. Um, I got to explain this to my grandchildren uh, this week and having had the opportunity to go to Israel and have it explained to me. Um, you know, the bodies were wrapped, okay? Well, they would be wrapped, and obviously then a decaying body is going to have uh, odors that aren't pleasant. So they had added spices, and these ladies were coming to add more spices because eventually, in their minds and in their history, they knew that that body was going to decompose, and then they were going to take the bones from inside that shroud that the body's been wrapped in, and they're going to take those bones and put them in a small box, and then the small box is going to put in to another area of the tomb itself. And so then that tomb, if there was a tomb, was going to be able to hold uh, numerous family members. Okay? Well, we know that Christ has been put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The ladies are coming uh, with the idea that they are going to add more spices to his body. So Matthew 28 one through four, it says, in the end of the Sabbath, so Sabbath has ended, as Sabbath ends, your new week is going to begin, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, so our Sunday, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. So understand the timing. They're on their way, according to the scripture, and the earthquake takes place, and the angel has descended and rolled back that heavy stone that they thought there's no way that anybody's going to get in there to the body of Christ and to take the body. You know, these women would be coming thinking, who's going to roll the stone away for us so that we can put more spices with the body of Christ? They're going to come now, and this angel who has rolled back the stone says his countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him, catch this, and we're going to come back to this group, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The keepers. Remember those Roman soldiers. We're going to come back to, to them. But they've come, all right? Now, according to Matthew 28, 5 through 7, and other passages, parallel passages, there is more than one angel present. The angel in verses 5 through 7 uh, answered, said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. So imagine their uncertainty as they look into that tomb. I've been in one that they will say is Joseph of Arimathea. I don't know whether it is or it isn't, it could be, but being similar, it'd be one that was of a wealthy person. You're able to go in and to see where the body would have been laying uh, while it decomposed. Okay? He's not there. See, this is where he was. But now verse 7, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. So these women have seen, and there is this confusion. 
that is going on in their minds. We've seen angels, and look at what they've told us. And what does this mean? And remember, Mary Magdalene is one of those. Okay? When you compare that with Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 11, Mary is going to have gone, and these ladies are going to be going and telling the disciples, but Mary is coming across someone she thinks is a gardener. It says, now when Jesus, this is verses 9 through 11, Mark 16, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So no doubt about who this is. Okay. Remember now, uh, when you compare that with other passages, she is going to look at him and say, Sir, did you remove the body? Where have you put him? And he's going to say, Mary. And she is going to recognize him. Her eyes are going to be open. The uncertainty is going to be gone for her. Mark tells us as it goes on in verse 10, she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. That uncertainty going on in the group, especially the disciples. And verse 11 says, And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. It doesn't convince them. You know, we give Thomas a hard time. But even at this moment, someone has come in and said, I have seen Christ. He's risen. Where did you see him? When did you see him? How did you see him? And the uncertainty is still there and they don't believe. Now, Go back to those women who've seen these angels, because Mary is evidently separated in some way from them, uh, and run back. The verses uh, in Matthew 28, 8 through 10, again, they've seen the angels. Let's take them a little bit farther. They departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' words. So they're on their way. They're going to tell the disciples. And as they went to tell his disciples... Behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Their uncertainty is gone. They have seen the Christ. They go and run and tell. Okay? Now, John chapter 20, verses 3 through 10, picks up our picture here with Peter and John. Peter, therefore, went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. So John's younger, he ran faster, and he came to the sepulcher. But John, in his reverence, if you will, perhaps, maybe his fear, perhaps his uncertainty. Anyway, he stops at the door. Peter, that guy that rushes forward, that speaks without thinking, he runs in. John says that he's stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went and also that other disciple, now John enters, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead, meaning they're still not understanding, they're not putting their pieces together. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. What does this mean? Do I believe? Where is my uncertainty gone yet? And I don't know that it totally is. They, they believe, all right, the women have said they've seen him. He's risen. I want to believe. Remember, 
that father who wanted his child healed, help thou my unbelief? You know, is that where we find ourselves? Let's go back to those Roman soldiers. Remember now that time frame, it said that the women were on their way, the earthquake came, the angel rolled back the stone, and the keepers fell as dead men. Think about the uncertainty of those Roman soldiers who have been guarding the tomb. They've got to go back and give a report. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. We were there. There was this earthquake and we fell down like dead men and, and when it was over, the stone is rolled over. We didn't do it. And the tomb was empty. And here's your leaders, and we'll even look at an uncertainty on their part. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they, the Roman soldiers, took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Their uncertainty. What did this mean? I, I want to understand. Um, Max Lucado has a story about a centurion that was there. Uh, and it's obviously probably fictionalized, but there's also a video tied to it. But it's a, a, an interesting story that he then wants to pursue the truth. I was there. I'm not going to accept the bribe money. I'm not going to lie about what I saw. Because for a Roman soldier, you've lost, in essence, a prisoner. You deserve to die. You failed at your duty. And yet here they are not dying but having their pockets full of coins. It doesn't make sense. There has to be uncertainty on their part. What did this really mean? Unfortunately, for the most part, we don't know a story of those particular soldiers perhaps pursuing the truth. Uh, what about those Pharisees themselves? their uncertainty. He said something about rising again. And we tried to stop it. And and, and these things happened. And, and what do these things mean? And, and no, we can't believe. Well, I refuse to believe. Because it means I'm wrong. And he's right. And again, many of them would not believe, but they held on to their uncertainty. And it's an uncertainty that they have passed on to the Jewish nation, where Orthodox Jews still follow the Old Testament, still looking for a Messiah to come, because they do not want to believe that Christ fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now, we're going to look here uh, there's just one comment that's made interesting enough. We're going to come to the two on the road to Emmaus, but in their conversation at the very end as they are reporting, they make one quick comment about Peter. And it's very limited, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And if you look over in 1 Corinthians 15, um, I think it's around verse 5, but it mentions again that the Lord appeared to Cephas, to Peter, by himself. But we have no details of that particular meeting. Um, but at this point, I'm going to try, as I would put this onto the, the Facebook connection, I want to connect you to, and you can just simply stop the, uh, the lesson here, and doing a separate tab in YouTube so you can come back to this same spot. But for you to look up a man named Philip Webb and a song, He is Alive. Uh, 
This song, song He is Alive, tells the story of, of Peter. Um, and I think if you listen to the words of the song, you may find yourself in that place of Peter, of feeling like you failed God, there's no hope, there's no way, and yet he forgives. So take a, take a moment here and stop here and, and listen to that because it fits right here with this comment about he appeared to Simon, to Peter. Well, let's look at those two on the road to Emmaus. And it's a rather lengthy passage, but I'm going to go ahead and read through it uh, to remind ourselves of the story. Because it pretty much, they answer the uncertainty. It says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he, and now Christ is speaking, said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, uh, when we get into the study of Romans, uh, we're going to uh, come to this idea of the gospel and look at uh, the prophecies. And I found a, a nice website for that gave me a good group of 40, but the website actually had a list of over 300 prophecies related to Christ. Uh, so imagine Christ doing this now with these two individuals. Verse 28, And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, and blessed it, and brake, and gave to them. So imagine this picture. Perhaps these two were some of those who were in that upper room, that the upper room was not just the, the twelve. But there were many there because there were going to be many that were gathered there after the crucifixion, wondering what this all meant. Okay? But notice what it says. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while we talked with us by the way, and while he opened us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. See, there's many saying, guess what? Their uncertainty is gone. The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Now, Simon's there. I wonder what Simon is thinking, what he's, what he's saying. Hey, hey, he appeared to you. We don't, we don't have those details there. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Wow. Uncertainty's gone on everybody's part, right? Not quite. Not still. You continue in the passage in Luke chapter 24 and you see the ten are gathered together. Thomas is not there. <coughs> <clears throat> 
And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, and you know, they're like, is this real? Have ye here any meat? Has nothing to do with Christ being hungry. And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. A living person is going to eat. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Uncertainty is gone. And now let's get to the uncertainty of Thomas, who wasn't there. But Thomas, this is from John chapter 20, verse 24 to 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And this we're talking about as a period of about another eight days. Okay? The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. I need to see and I need to touch. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst. He just appeared, said unto them, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. His uncertainty was finally gone. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. A lot of uncertainty on the part of these individuals. There is never uncertainty on the part of Christ. He was always certain about what his work for the Father was to be and when it was to be completed. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he had promised them he was going to rise again. And scripture tells us he rose by his power. He rose by the power of the Father. He rose by the power of the Spirit. He arose and is a risen Savior. And we are in this verse 28, 29, if we believe. Blessed are they that have not seen. We weren't there and yet have believed. I'm going to wrap this up with just a comment and then I'm going to suggest to you just a, a song. Again, that's encouraged me. Simple song. Um, it says the world is right now facing a lot of uncertainty. You know, Questions. When will the pandemic end? How many will get sick? How many will die? When will life return to normal? And what will normal even look like? For many, it has not caused them to run to God. At least that is not evident in the news. Uh, their doubts about God may be increasing because God is supposed to be a God of love and would never allow something like this to happen. As Christians, it's not that we have all the answers. We do not know how long the pandemic will last or how many will be affected or what the world will be like after it runs its course. What we do know is that we do not have to fear. Christians may become sick and some may die, but they have the assurance of an eternal home with God. It is a certainty 
because not only did Christ die for our sins, but he arose a victorious Savior that we can put our faith and confidence in. It is a certainty that we serve a risen Savior who is in the world today. I'm going to put again with Facebook um, a little simple song that's simply named Jesus, Thank You. Uh, the particular one I'm looking at is a group called Renew or Renew Music uh, that are singing it. Young Girl is doing the main part of the song. But just a simple song. It starts, The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. Let me just pull the words down here. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. The second verse, By your perfect sacrifice I've been brought near. Your enemy you've made your friend. Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace, your mercy and your kindness know no end. But notice the, the chorus. Okay. It says, Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. This is what the cross did. But not the cross itself, because others have been crucified on crosses. But Christ on the cross for you and for me. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, then take this opportunity, take this time, and make sure of that relationship. I know I'm a sinner. I can't do anything to fix it, but Christ died on the cross to pay my penalty. And I believe in Him and what He did on the cross. And I believe He's a risen Savior. And I want to ask Him into my heart and into my life today. And if you really mean it, then you're going to know Christ in a personal way for eternity.